Okay, we're going to be in the book of Ruth. Interesting book. It's one of the two books in the Bible that literally God's not even mentioned in it. And people have always wondered why is the book of Ruth, you know, the Jewish people especially always wondered why God had him put the book of Ruth in the Bible, you know, to canonize it, put it in the, in the Word of God. <clears throat> and the truth of the matter is, it teaches two of the most uh, fantastic doctrines that God has established in the Old Testament that gives us the grounds for and the type and shadow of the only reasons why Jesus, the Son of God, could come and pay for your sins and your debts here on this earth. It's in this book. It's called the Near Kinsman Redeemer. And this gives us a story of the Near Kinsman Redeemer. And understand that only the near kinsman, the nearest of kin, had the right to redeem you out of if you were a Jewish person and you had lost your farm, you lost everything through bankruptcy or through any other uh, sad thing that happened to you. You could wait till the year of Jubilee and the year of Jubilee when the high priest and, uh, died or Jubilee, then things would return back to normal. But that could be 50 years away. But if you weren't willing to wait for 50 years, then the near kinsman, your near kinsman at any time could redeem you and your property out of the debt. And it's a type and shadow of why Jesus was allowed to come and to redeem you out of your debt, sin. And we'll talk a little more about that as we get into it, as we see the story, as it unfolds. So, in chapter 1 of Ruth, now it came to pass in the days of the judges ruled. Now, understand, this is a continuation of the book of Judges. And, and what is the key theme throughout Judges? Every man did what was right in his own eyes. That's the way they were at that time. Everybody just, whatever they thought was what must be what God thinks, and every man just did whatever he thought was right. Of course, we see time after time, man's thinking just got him into a world of trouble, and God would have to bail him out. So this is in that time of the judges ruled. He says, and there was a famine in the land. Now, in the land, famine, you have to understand we're going to be talking about Bethlehem. Bethlehem is, means, the name literally means the house of bread. To have a famine in the house of bread doesn't seem right. There has to be a, a real problem going on here for the house of bread to run out of bread. And it would be only because they have the people have turned their hearts away from God and God has dried up the land in order to get their attention. Not as punishment, but to, uh, to realign them back to where they should be. You know, and so here it is, a famine that is in that land. He says, and a certain man in Bethlehem, Judah, he says, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And when you stop and think about that, okay, first of all, you know, at the beginning here, we just got to get the actors all, you know, lined out who they are. So you understand when they come out in their little mask or whatever, which one's happy and which one's sad and which, okay, Moab, who's Moab? The country of Moab, where'd they come from? You know the story about how that Lot was in Sodom and Gomorrah. Eight, two angels came and rescued him out. He, his wife, and his daughters, two daughters. And how his wife, when she was told not to, she went ahead and looked back anyway, and she became a pillar of salt. So it ended up Lot and his two daughters escaped out of the country. And they went and they were told to go into a little town. I mean, not to go into a little town. They asked to go there. It ended up, they end up in a cave up in the mountains. And in that cave, because they finally come to the realization, their daughters, in their mind, remember, every man does what's right in his own eyes. Well, women were doing what was right in their own eyes, too. They said, oh, there's no man left on the earth for us. There's nothing. So they end up getting their father drunk. And they had incestuous relationship with him. And two children were born, one to each of them. 
Mob is one of those children. Okay, so now we know where Mob comes from. And they've been fighting against the nation of Israel ever since. Just like Lot and his herdsmen fought against Abraham and his herdsmen for space to feed their cattle and for, you know, the land and everything else. It's been, it continues on now and through Mob. So here, and then we might ask the question, when things get tough with the Lord, well, we just quit and go find another God, right? The God of plenty, maybe, or the God of, of, of wealth, or the God of, you know. Well, no, you're kind of supposed to stay put, aren't you? And the best thing to do is get down on your knees and seek the Lord even more so with your heart. Find out why there's no bread in the house of bread. They didn't. So this man leaves and he heads for the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons, and the name of the man was Emelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. And he came with his two sons, and Moholan and Chilon. And they were Ephronites, he says, of Bethlehem. Now, who else is also of that line? Well, later on, we're going to see that is spoken of exactly of David. David is out of this line. This is the, this is the, grand, the great-grandmom of David, King David. We'll find that out later. He says, and they came into the country of Moab, and they continued there. They continued there for ten years. You know, it's uh, like somebody once said, it, it's a whole lot easier to, uh, to get sucked up into the wrong country than it is to get out of the wrong country. Here, 1 verse 3, and Emelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. So, you know, he's gone. He, they left the country. They went to a country they probably shouldn't have gone to. He dies, and she's got her two sons. And he took, the two sons took wives of the women of Moab. Now, you might recall in scriptures that even once the temple is built because of the the Moabites fighting so much against the nation of Israel in the way they did it and I'm not going to go into all that right now but just underhand just know that it, the women had a whole lot to do with it well anyway because of that it was said that the Moabites couldn't enter into the temple until the 10th generation that's how long they they couldn't even enter into the temple of God they couldn't become they couldn't become converts, okay? And he says these, they took two wives of this, of these people, of the Moabites. And he says uh, the name of one was uh, Ophrah, he says, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. And Meholan, he says, and Chilon died, also both of them, and the women were left with her two sons, he said, were left of her two sons and her, and her husband. So her husband and her, and her boys are both gone. You know, she's in the wrong place. And now you, you might think, well, she's being disciplined by God for leaving, you know, her country and her land and whatever. And the truth of that is that God isn't disciplining. A lot of times God allows things to happen in order to get our attention, to get us back, to correct us and get us back in on, on the right course and the right path. In verse 6 it says, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited the people in giving them bread. Otherwise, the people that were back in uh, Bethlehem had apparently turned their hearts back to the Lord. Maybe there was a prophet at that time had come through and got them to turn their, back, their hearts back to the Lord, stop doing whatever it was that God was really displeased they were doing. So the rain and the harvest all came, and they, they had bread in the house of bread again. And she heard about it. Now, Notice that it, it's kind of like how, how strong of a Jewish believer are these people when they're led around by their bellies. Now when I say that, you can think of the New Testament scriptures that talk about Christians that are led around by their bellies, by food. Wherever the food is, that must be where God wants me to go, you know. And I'm the worst one to talk about that. I got saved because of a potluck. But... Uh, <laughs> I do like to eat. But anyway, here she is, here's this out about him. And it's in verse 7, it says, Wherefore, she went forth out of the place that she was, her and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. And the Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. He said, then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice, and they wept. Notice, both of them are weeping. 
He says in verse 10, And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. Otherwise, we've married into the family now. We'll just go with you to the, your people. And in verse 11, it says, Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that you may be, they may, may be your husbands? It was a Jewish practice and actually a law, a, a, a law in, in Deuteronomy, that, that if a, a man was married to a woman, an elder brother, and he died, that the younger brother then, when he become of age, would marry that woman, and then the children would then be raised in the name of the elder brother. And, of course, that's one of the things that, uh, when they tried to trick Jesus, they threw at him, and they went through seven younger brothers, you know, and whatever, and then asked him whose wife will she be when they finally, you know, and, and, and what was really funny about that story when they were trying to trick Jesus is that it was the Sadducees that were testing him and asking that. And yet, when you know about the Sadducees, you realize they don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. But that was their trick question for Jesus about the resurrection. But anyway, uh, but she said, you know, even if, if, if I was to have, ch you know, if I could get married tonight and, uh, and uh, uh, if I'd had a baby tonight, uh, would you be willing to wait all those years till he's old enough to be your husband, you know, and, and to raise children to him? So she says in 12, he says, turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. And if I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight and should also bear sons, he says, would you tarry for them till they are grown? Would you stay, he says, for them, he says, from having a husband? Nay, my daughters, for it is, given, it is grieve, grievous unto me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. She's seeing that she is in trouble with the Lord. You know, being a Jewish woman and of that nation, and what I'm sure she was raised in the Jewish laws and Levitical laws and whatever, she knows she shouldn't have left. She knows now she's in trouble, and, it's the, and she also knows that nothing happens to her that isn't gone through the hands of the Lord. There's a reason for everything, you know, which is really good to come to that conclusion in your life. So she's telling her daughter-in-laws, no, this is not because of you guys, this is because of me. 14, he says, and they lifted up their voice and they wept again and Ophir kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth claved unto her, or cleaved unto her. You know, and, and uh, I, 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 I like that word. You, you'll get it in the New Testament, if you, in, in Romans 10, 8, 9, if you believe in your heart and you, and you uh, confess with your mouth. It, it literally, it means cleave. It means to, to hang on. And I always think about the, the mother monkey jumping from tree to tree and that little baby monkey hanging on for dear life because there's nothing between him and the ground other than his grip on mom. That's that cleaving. That's how tight of a grip that that is. And Ruth cleaved unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people. He says, Unto her little g-gods, return thou after thy sister-in-law. Otherwise, Moabites had their own little gods there and whatever, and, and Ophrah had gone back, and she's saying to Ruth, go back with her. It's okay. I free you from this, you know. But listen to what Ruth says here in 16. Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee, for whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou dies, I will die. There I will, I will be buried, the Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. What is the difference between her and Ophrah? Now, Ophrah, remember, cried uh, when he left her, and she kissed her mother-in-law, She came, but she went back. You see, I liken these two girls as a type and shadow. I kind of look at them like a lot of the people that followed Jesus around when he was walking on the earth. And there was a whole multitudes of people that would, you know, go across the lake, Gezeret, you know, to the other side, run clear around, and they were always trying to find Jesus. He fed 3,000 one time, 5,000 another time. He healed everyone in every town that he went into many times over. And, and so they were, this huge multitude wanted to be with him, Messiah Jesus. But then he went to the cross. Messiah Jesus ended up being just a human being, and they scourged him, and they put him to death on that cross. And a good deal of them just went home then. Said he was great when he was alive. Free food, healings, we got it all from him. 
Sure wish they wouldn't have killed him. And then there's that other group that said, yeah, he died, but boy, the words he had was life. And, and they just kept on believing and believing even though he was dead. And I see the difference between these two girls is one of them was married and had a life and a husband and whatever. He dies. Okay, what's the next thing in life? Let's go on. And the other one, I liken unto like Daniel, who purposed in her heart, no, I'm in this family, and I'm with your God, and where you go, I'm going to go. Where you eat, I'm going to eat. Where you sleep, I'm going to sleep. Where you die, I'm going to die. Your God is my God. You see, it's a heart transformation. It's a heart change. And, the, and I think the difference, as I see it, and this is what makes you, you know, we can't tell. When somebody says, oh, yeah, I've asked Jesus into my heart. Did they do that just in their head? Because they remember the time and they did it and they actually said the words. Or did it take place out of their heart? And now, what is the difference? Well, remember the parable where Jesus talked about the sowing of the seed? And he talked about some seed falls on the rocky soil and the sun comes out and heats up the rocks and the seed springs up real quick and it's ahead of everything else and it grows and then it dies because there's no root to it. And then there's other seed that hits the ground and it's a little slower coming up. But it comes up and it grows because the roots are deeply ground into the soil and it's getting its life and its nutrition out of that soil and it grows you see, some people, be, I think that, son, I say some people, most all of us got started because we were in trouble. We knew it. We knew we came to that place. You, the Holy Spirit had finally got through. You're a sinner. You're going into a lot of trouble here, and you can't get yourself out. And we come to the Lord because of that. He's, that's what Savior is. He threw us the, the ring, hooked to the rope, the lifeline, you know, because we were drowning. But then we get this kind of a, we get to hear the story about the salvation plan and Jesus died for our sins and, and we were buried with Christ, we rose again and now we, are, we, we get this reward and we're in the inheritance and, we're, and our, our, our eyes go, oh, really? Oh, gold streets, oh, mansions, oh, robes, oh. And now we're looking at heaven and going, oh, king's kid, I like that, you know, and, and we start kind of looking at all that. As maturity comes in the Christian walk, all that stuff starts to fade and you start to look at him. Who is this Savior? Who is this guy? You know, and we start to see him and we, and we want to be, we want to know more and more who he is and be with him. And it doesn't matter if we're on the gold streets. It doesn't matter if we're in heaven or on the earth or we're what, you know, um, doesn't matter because we just want to be with him as you maturity as it grows and whatever i see ruth has made a heart commitment ophrah was a good girl she was a good wife she was a good daughter-in-law but her commitment was a, sh a little shallow that's what worries me a little bit about some christians is is their commitment a little shallow you see Death is what brought this commitment out in Ruth. Death of her husband. Death to her married life. Death to all of her dreams and hopes of children. And, you know, and all, depth to all that brought this commitment out. And she realized, no, I'm, I'm here regardless of what happens. I, I think that by feeding the word of God into our hearts... Then when the bread dries up in the house of bread in our lives, the commitment will be there. And, and uh, with that commitment, it will carry you through the drought. It will carry you through the hard time. Jesus himself went through the drought. Driven into the desert by the Holy Spirit right after he's baptized for 40 days, no food, no water. And then the greatest deceiver and tempter that's ever been created came to him and tested him 
to see if he could get him to sin. Forty days, no food, no water. The house of bread had dried up. But because of the word of God in his heart, the tempter, the tester, was driven away. Jesus passed the test. Now, we'll come back to that in a minute because that becomes, brings us to a real important part. Why did Jesus get to even take that test? We'll get back to that in just a moment. In verse 18, it says, When she saw that she was steadfast-minded to go with her, that she left speaking, off speaking unto her. Now, in this little, in my mind, and I want to put it in your mind a little bit, let's kind of look at Naomi as a type and shadow of the Holy Spirit. We're going to see that. We're, now we're going to look at Ruth as a type and a shadow of the person who wants to be with God. That's the decision Ruth has made. Your God will be my God. Okay, in verse 19 then. So the two went until they came to Bethlehem, and it came to pass when they come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them, and they said, Is this Naomi? Why, why did we have question if it was Naomi? Well, when she left, her name means pleasant, and when she left, she was the most pleasant person in the world to be around. But when she comes back, she's not so pleasant now. She's lost her husband and two sons and one daughter-in-law, and she's got another one to take care of, and she does. She has nothing to provide for her with. She's broke. And she has nothing. In verse 20 it says, She said unto them, Call me not Naomi, or pleasant. Call me Mara. Which means um, uh, pitiful. Uh, I, I, I'm, I am, I'm just pitiful. And she says, For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me it the way she says this is not that she's mad at what God did it's that she knows she deserved everything she got but it still was very hard that she has brought now she's come back uh, understand that Every time somebody leaves something that's that of the Lord that's good, we have two cases where we see this in the Bible. One is the prodigal son. They always leave with stuff, full. But when they finally get, and it's all gone out there in the world, because the world sucks it up, and all they end up, they end up, they find themselves not only feeding the pigs, but eating with the pigs. You know, the slop that he's slopping the hogs with, he's eating. He then remembers to go back. He has nothing when he goes back. When Naomi and her husband left, they had substance, and they went to Moab with substance. Coming back after the death of all of her plans, her husbands, and everything else, she comes back with nothing. But in both cases, I want you to see something that's really interesting. The reason I brought up the prodigal son is because it's the only place in the Bible where we're given a type and shadow of the Father in heaven, and he's not seated. When the prodigal son comes, he sees him afar off, and he takes off running to him. That's how much the Father wants to bring the one back who went away. He runs to him. It's the only place in the Bible that the father's type and shadowed and isn't seated, seated on a throne. When you see that Naomi comes back here, she, is, she feels that she's been bitterly dealt with by the Lord, and she has. But what we're going to find out is because of her heart and because of Ruth's heart, they end up being one of the most special people in the line of Jesus Christ coming into this world. This is, this is an awesome story. And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, but call me Mara, for all many has dealt bitterly with me. And in 21 it says, And I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Who brought her home? The Lord. Brought her home empty. Why then call, ye, call me Naomi, seeing that the Lord has testified against me? And the Almighty has afflicted me. Yeah, I was in the affliction, but what the affliction, he got her attention enough to come home. Do you see that? The same with the prodigal son. It was in the affliction, the running out, the, the, the almost starvation where he was at, that got him to get enough sense to 
come home. Sometimes in our lives, the Lord bring, lets us go to that point, brings us to that point where that it's, it's the most bitterness thing in our lives, it seems like, that could possibly happen, but it's to bring us home. Because no matter, understand, the absolute best and the most that the world can offer you isn't near the least that the Lord has. To come home empty to the Lord is far better than to be in the world with everything. Paul said, what is it if I gain the whole world and lose my soul? See? So anyway, in 22 it says, Naomi returned. Ruth and the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, he says, with her, which were turned out of the country of Moab. Now what are all the Jewish people thinking when, Ruth comes, uh, when Naomi comes back with a Moabitess, daughter-in-law? Oh, man. That's not good. That's not good at all. And they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. Okay, you guys are scholars. When's the barley harvest? At the Passover. The time of the Passover. The Passover. The cross. The death angel going by. The, blood, the lamb's blood on the lint on the doorpost. The Passover. That's where you always have to come back to the Lord is in the Passover. It's in the repentance. It's where you always have to start. You start there in the very beginning when you become born again. Should you backslide, you have to come back to that cross and start again. You have to start at the Passover. But why? Because you're in the death. You're out here in death now. You, you got sin on you, and, and that's a death sentence, and you have to come back, and you start there again. You start with the Lord. Okay. Now, he says in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, and Naomi, he says, had a kinsman of her husband, a mighty man of wealth in the family of Emelech, and his name was Boaz. He says, and Ruth, the Moabitess, said unto Naomi, let me now go to the field and gleam ears of corn or wheat, he says, after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, go, my daughter. Now, they're, they're just back, and it's the time of the Passover, and, and she's going to go out because this was the law in Israel. They didn't have government welfare. What they had was church, God's welfare. And the law was is that when you reap your harvest, anything that you drop, you, it's against the law to pick it up. You go through your field. If you dropped something, you must leave it. Otherwise, if nowadays, of course, with our machinery, we pretty well gleam a field when they go through it. But what if the, if the, uh, the shoot on the combine uh, was dumping it and it went awry and piled up a pile of grain on the ground. Well, nowadays you'd see somebody getting out there with a shovel and some bags and they'd be shoveling that up. But in Israel, that would have been against the law. You see, the, the reapers were hand reapers and they gathered it up in stocks and if any of the grain fell out, they had to leave it. Why? Because the poor people, by law, could come through behind the reapers and anything that didn't get reaped, it can only go through the field once. If they missed the corners, or the, and they were to leave the corners, by the way, but if they, they missed something in the middle of the field or something fell, the poor people, that's how they got their food. They gleaned behind the gleaners, and they could take it home, and it was theirs. That was the law that God set up. He says, and so she's going to go out to a field, and she's going to glean because they're hungry. They don't have anything even to eat. So in three, it says, she went, she came, and she gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her, and her says, her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging to Boaz. She didn't know it was Boaz's field. There wasn't a big sign that says, this is the, the ranch of Boaz. No, it, it wasn't like that at all. It was just a field, and there was people reaping in it. So she got in behind the reapers, and she was trying to gather up something to take home to eat. And, and he happened to be, it says, was the kinsman, the kindred of Amalek. Now, Behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. So Boaz, you know, this is the time of the Passover. He then leaves Bethlehem, comes out to his field, and he said unto his reapers. Now, now you have to see, by what he's saying here, you can tell what kind of a Jewish man he is. This is what he said to his hired reapers, right? The Lord be with you. And they answered him and said, the Lord bless you. Now, isn't that, uh, I mean, between a boss and his laborers, uh, isn't that something? But that would be the kind of laborers he would hire would be also godly men, and he was a very godly man himself. You know, so he was, he's a guy that's following, 
He, you know that when the, when the house of bread ran out of bread, he didn't leave the country. He's following the law. He's, he's a Jewish Jew, okay? And five, it says, and, and when, then he says, then said Boaz to his servant who was set over the reapers, whose damsel is this? He looked out there in the field and she's a looker, you know, and she's working real hard, you know. You didn't, you know, you didn't, how do I say that? Uh, not too many good lookers were out working in the heat of the sun and whatever. They found other things to go do or they got husbands real early in life and whatever. But she's a hard worker and she's out there working. He takes note of her. Now, in my little mind and our little type and shadow thing, remember, Boaz is going to be the type and shadow of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he looks and he sees this worker following his Jewish reapers through the field and she's gleaming. And, and he looks at her and he's going like, you know, I've not seen her around, you know, <laughs> caught his eye here, you know, and in six, he says, the servant that was set over the reapers answered and he said, it's the Mobitus damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Mob. Oh, Mobitus. Oh, with Naomi. Now remember, he's near kinsman to Naomi. And he knew all about him, Amalek Levian. He's been gone for 10 years. He heard that Naomi came back, you know, and he, she he brought this daughter-in-law with her and that her husband had died. And I mean, he's heard the whole story. And he looks and he goes, oh, that's her. Okay. And she said, I, I pray you, let me gleam and gather after the reapers amongst the sheaves. This is what she told the head reaper. He says, so she came and has continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. It, otherwise, in a little shack, the place where they all had their lunch out of the sun and whatever. But she was a hard worker. And she wasn't out there fooling with the men. She was out there working, you know. And, and you see, the reputation of a Mobitus, the sin they got into was that she would have been out there fooling with the men. Okay? That would have been, uh, you know, the, it, when you, when you uh, uh, types different kind of people. That's what they would have said about a Mobitus. But no, she's a worker. You know, she's a hard worker from sun up till now, he says in eight. He says, then Boaz, he says, said in Boaz unto Ruth, he says, harvest thou not, my daughter. He says, go not to gleam in another field. He says, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Otherwise, I know your, your Naomi's daughter-in-law and I and he's not telling her yet but he's you know I'm I'm I know Naomi and I want you just stick I want you to be safe so the men don't bother you and, and, and stay around my the daughters of my family and reap with them now she would have had to been behind the reapers behind his daughters reapers the you know the family women that were reaping and then she'd have been about third one through the field you know how little she'd have got? But now she's moved up. And she's now up in, and right behind the reapers, okay? Nine, it says, let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap. He says, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they should not touch you? He says, and when thou art athirst, he says, go into the vessel and drink that which the young men have drawn. And it, see, he's the type and shadow of the Lord. And he's got this Mobitus. Now, that, when you think of that in the type and shadow of Jesus Christ and, and us as being the worldly, the, the reputation, the one that God wouldn't bring home you know, to his family. And, and it's like, but he's saying, now, I want you to be with my maidens. I want you to be able, and you can drink. You can drink from our vessels. See, otherwise, the men will fetch the water for you and bring it here. Because she would have ordered to have a drink all this day she's been working, she'd have had to carry water with her all the way and trying to gather grain to and keep it with her. Y you, you realize that, I mean, there's nobody was helping her before in the field whatsoever. But notice the reaper knew who she was and had been watching her and all the people had been watching her all day. That's something to think about is in, in our Christian walk, as the Lord is bringing us in and working with us, understand that everybody's watching us. And it talks about that in the New Testament, that even the angels are watching us. 
you know, that, that they're watching the whole situation, watching the change, and they're seeing it. And, and, and the, the thought comes to me that the angels even say, what is, what is man that, that God is even mindful of him? What is this woman? That I'm sure that the reapers were thinking, why is he even mindful of this? She's just a, a mobitus. You know, why do you even care? In verse 10 it says, Then she fell on her face, and she bowed herself to the ground, and she said unto him, Why have I found grace in your eyes? And thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger. Have you ever wondered why the Lord cared enough to call you I've wondered that many times because I can look back in my life all the way back many years before I actually confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and I could see his hand on situations in my life keeping me from this or saving me from that and telling me the duck when the bullets were flying or something you know and um, I can just look back and see time after time and I'm wondering I many times stopped and thought why me? I, you know, why not other people I knew that didn't? Why me? You ever wonder that? She's wondering that. Why, why me? In 11, he says, And Bo answered and said unto her, It has fully been showed me, now get this, all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thy husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother in the land of thy nativity, and art come unto the people which thou knowest not heretofore. He says, The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee in the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. You see that, have you ever wondered, it says, not only are we, our sins have been forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ, but we're, now we're going to get a, a share of the inheritance of God Everything that the Father has given to Jesus, you're going to get a share in that? Why? I mean, the people of this world, when someone dies, they're also trying to figure out how they can cut everybody out from getting shares so they get most of it or all of it, you know? But you're being brought in, and, and you know, and here Boaz is saying to her, you, you're going to, under the wings what thou hast come to trust, just because by faith, she has come to trust in the Lord. And she's proven it with her actions of being there and taking care of Naomi and being a good, sound daughter-in-law, okay? 13, it says, Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for thou hast comforted me, and for thou hast spoken friendly unto thy handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thy handmaidens. See? A and it, it is true Jesus, he, he, how many times did he, well, remember he said, in the, he said to the uh, Gentile woman, she came and she wanted Jesus to, uh, to heal her daughter who had a demon, you know, and, and she come and Jesus said to him, you know, finally after she got his attention and, and he held her off, but he finally said, you know, it's not fit that I would give the bread, you know, for the children to the, throw it to the little dogs, you know. And she said, well, even the little dogs get the crumbs, you know. Jesus came first for the nation of Israel and then for the world. The nation of Israel first. You, you, that's his heart was for the nation of Israel. That's what was so heartbreaking that it was the nation of Israel that turned him over to be crucified. When he returns though, because remember his then kingdom he was setting up with his church in the very beginning was all nation of Israel. Every one of the born-again believers in the beginning of the church was Jewish. Every one of them. Till we get down in, in the Cornelius' house, in the book of Acts, then we bring the Gentiles in. Now, the Gentiles have basically taken over the whole church, but when Jesus left, they were all Jews. That's why we know that when he comes back, he's expecting to get his Jewish bride, just like Jacob was expecting to get Rachel you know, when he went into the tent because he had worked seven years for his Rachel and he woke up the next morning and found out it was Leah and he'd been slipped a Mickey, you know, and Leah was in there. She had the tender eyes and, and whatever. Well, she is the type of the shadow of the Gentile. When Jesus returns and takes his, his Jewish bride off the earth, he's going to be surprised to find out it's all Gentile now. And he's going to say, what is this? I've been tricked. 
And the father will say to him, work another seven years of great tribulation, and you can have Rachel too, the, the Jewish bride. See, that's the type and shadow of that. So anyway, uh, she's saying, I'm not like one of your handmaids. I'm different. I'm a Moabitess. And 14, and Boaz said unto her, at mealtime, come thou hither and eat of the bread and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers. And, and she reached her parched corn and she did eat and was uh, sufficed, he says, and left. And he says, and, and when she had risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men saying, let her glean even amongst the sheaves and reproach her not. Otherwise, the stuff they hadn't even got to and cut yet, let her go in and get all she can get. And don't say anything to her. You know, she's now moved from third position to second position. Now she's up and she's ahead of the gleamers. Do, do you, uh, you see that? You and I were of the Gentile sin of the world and who was going to save us from our sins? And now, because of Jesus Christ and his shed blood for us, we're moved up not only ahead of the angels, but ahead of the nation of Israel even now, and we're going to be the bride of this young Jewish man called Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Isn't that amazing? How, and how did we get moved up? What did you or I do, any of us do, that would cause him to move us up? Prove faithful. That's the key. That's the one. That's right. 16. You've been in class. And let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her. Otherwise, purposely dropped some grain. Whoops. I just dropped a bundle. Can't pick it up. That'd be against the law, you know. Ruth, I just dropped a bundle. Okay. And leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. In 17, so she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out that she had gleaned. Otherwise, see, it was in the, still in the stalks. That's what they get, and they take it over there, and they beat the, the, the grain out of it, and they don't want the straw. I mean, it's worthless to her. She didn't have any animals to lay on it or anything. So anyway, she gets all the grain, and, you know, and it was about a, a, an ephod of barley. Well, that would be, you know, like almost a bushel, you know, a, a peck of a, a barley. In 18, and she took it up, and she went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw that she had gleaned and, she, and what she brought forth, and she gave her that she had reserved after she had sufficed. Otherwise, she didn't even eat all the parched corn that was given to her. She put some in her pocket to take home to Naomi. She's out working all day, but she only ate half of the portion she was given, and she's taking the other half home. Now, we could do a real, get into a real tithing thing here, and what, but yeah, we won't do that. But anyway, 19. And her mother-in-law said unto her, he says, where is thou glean today? And where, where were you? He says, blessed, he says, be is it that that did take knowledge of thee. And, and she showed her mother-in-law of whom she had wrought and said, this man's name of who I, I work for today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, he said, blessed be of the Lord, he says, who has not left off his kindness in the living and to the dead. He says, And Naomi said unto her, The man is near kin to, uh, unto us, one of our next kinsmen. Okay. Now i got to explain the near kinsman law. This is the place where it all is going to now start and come into play, and we're going to see it play out in here. Near kinsman. Okay. When, uh, uh, if a person lost their piece of land, uh, it didn't even matter if he got into a, a crap game and shot the dice and lost or a card game or, or just had bad years and luck and, and made mismanagement of the field, whatever it was, when he lost his land to a banker or to someone else, you know, was indebted to it, along with the land oftentimes went the people and they became then, uh, you know, his servants and whatever else uh, along with the land. But remember, the land was given out by the Lord to specific families in specific areas through Moses, who then actually Joshua was the one that gave it out, but Moses is the one through the Lord that assigned it to them. And they each had their plot of land. And, and that to them, remember always that the nation of Israel is the fleshly uh, type and shadow of everything that the kingdom church is to be in the spirit. 
God plays it out, all the playouts in the flesh of the Jewish nation. We can look at it, see the type and shadow, and see things then in the spiritual realm that we as a kingdom should be walking. That when they don't walk right, what happened to them? When they do walk right, what happens to them? We can take that and type and shadow it into the Christian walk. So the land to them is their, their inheritance. It's their life. It's their name. It was like, uh, so often you ask men in America, you know, who are you? And he'll tell you what he does. Because it, for somehow or other, it got to be that our jobs was what we were. That, that's how we got titled, you know. They always called me a bump. No, I wasn't a bump. <laughs> it, uh, but it was like, you know, land to them was that. To us, it's, it, our inheritance is eternal glory with him. It's to be with him. That's our possession. It, we'll, we'll have the new Jerusalem. See, they have the earthly Jerusalem and the land around it. We'll have the new Jerusalem. But anyway, the next of kinsmen. When you lost it, the, the, then your next of kinsman, if he could afford it, could, if he wanted to, come in and because he's in the same family, he could buy that back from the banker or whoever it was now that owned it, including the people, and it would be brought back into his family because the land was never to leave their families. It was always to be in their families. And that, if you could understand the severity of that, then you would understand a whole lot of things that went on when kings took land that didn't belong to them and vineyards that had them killed and wanted to trade vineyards and stuff. They know that's my family's, you know, family stuff, you know. So what happens if, if the near kinsman couldn't afford it, the next near kinsman down could. I mean, they'd just go down the deal if they could. Or they could wait until... Either the high priest died, and then that was a that everything went back to the rightful owners. The bankers just lost everything. Or when the jubilee, so when a banker would buy a piece of land or something like that, he would think in his head, "Oh, jubilee is 20 years from now, so I'll be able to own this and and to use it for 20 years." So he, he the amount of money that he would pay or lend on it would be according to what it would be valued for 20 years. But if, like a lease, but if a jubilee was only five years away, then he'd only loan a little bit of money because he knew at jubilee time, it's all going to return back to the family. That was the ensure that the families didn't lose it, even if they had some bad apples in it that just lost everything continuously, it eventually would go back to the family. Okay, why is that so important? See, it just seemed like, well, for the nation of Israel, that's really good, and they get the land, it doesn't go from family to family. Okay, now let's take a huge leap into type and shadow. God speaks a world into existence. There's nothing on it. He creates, without a prototype, a full-blown human being. And the angels look at that and go, what is that? It can't fly. It can't do anything. What is that thing? You know, made us human. But he was glorious. God breathed his own breath into him, and he lived, and he had the glory of God in him. He was made in the image of God. He wasn't God, but he had the glory of God, and he was human on this earth. That would make him, if you really wanted to look at it, the God of this earth because he was the glory that was on this earth. He was given dominion of this earth. Adam literally was without sin, was the, was the made and had the glory of God in him. And he walked with Jesus, or with God, every day in the cool of the evening. He was purely holy until sin came in. When sin came in, everything that he had was now transferred to what we could, well, type it out like the banker. Satan is like the banker. He now owns it all. He got the birds, he got the fish, he got the animals, he got the humans, he got everything. Why? Because of sin nature now was passed down and God cursed the earth. Now the earth is totally cursed and it belongs, it's in the hands of Satan. All right? God's still in control of Satan, but he's the banker that's got it. In order now for that to be redeemed, one of two things has to happen. 
The high priest, and there was no high priest on the earth. There was only a high priest in heaven. Right? Melchizedek, the high priest of heaven, always was without father, without mother, no beginning, no end. So he was a high priest in heaven. And there was a tabernacle in heaven because Moses hadn't been born many generations down yet to see the copy and make the copy for earth. But there's one in heaven. So we have a high priest there. And remember, in the law, either the high priest has to die, and then everything returns back. Of course, Melchizedek isn't going to die. So rule that out. But the next near kinsman could redeem it back if he could afford it. Adam was human without sin. It was sin that he lost everything. What would it take to buy it back? Sinless to buy back what had been lost in sin, right? That would be the price. Sin took it out. Sinlessness would have to be the price to buy it back. But it would have to be a near kinsman. That's why Satan thought he had it made. Because why? God couldn't come down here and God was without sin. But God couldn't come down here. He's not a near kinsman to this human. But now you get the story why Jesus had to be born through a human and become 100% human. He's called in the New Testament the second Adam. Why is he called the second Adam? Because he's the only one without sin that's human that matched Adam in the beginning who was without sin and human. He's the near kinsman. Okay? There, that is really interesting because the price then to buy back everything that's been lost was what? The lack of sin. To, be, to die. Because it was sin that had caused the death. It had to be the lack of sin to die. So that's why Jesus' blood as a pure human, because his father wasn't Adam to start with. His father was the same one who built Adam, was the same one that built Jesus in the womb of Mary. And he's this near kinsman to the first Adam without sin, and his blood then would pay the penalty, the price for the first Adam. Does that make sense? Okay. What we're going to see, though, is that there was a near kinsman closer than Jesus. Bet you never thought about that before. There was a near kinsman closer. Who is the near kinsman closer who didn't want to mess up the reward? It had to be the Father. Why? Because when he created the nation of Israel, we find that we just went through Hosea. He calls the nation of Israel, his bride. The Father has created a bride for himself, the nation of Israel. When it come time to redeem the world and Gentiles, Mobitis, this is, this is, lots of them, us people in the world, the Father couldn't do it, he didn't, doesn't want to do it because it will mess up his Jewish relationship with his bride Israel, which isn't even finished yet. That's the seven years. Gets a little complicated here. Jesus then is the second near kinsman. He's the son of the first one. Now we'll go through the story here and you'll see it. It'll unfold right in front of you. I, I, here we go. And Ruth the Mobitus said unto him also, he says, thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest, otherwise not just this field, but all the fields and all the fields. And what is that a type and shadow of? Well, yeah, I know it's been 2,000 years and people have been, you know, going and going. But those are the harvests until all of them are done. You know, he says, and Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, he says, it is good, my daughter. He says that thou goest with, the, with his maidens. He says that they meet not in any other field. Don't get caught in some other field. Stay with the Lord. Don't go out to some other God's field, okay? And 23 it says, So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to gleam unto the end of the barley harvest and of the wheat harvest, and he dealt with her mother-in-law. And so she was getting all this good harvest and bringing it home to the mother-in-law. Now, it sounds like this is a long period of time, but understand, 
This is all taking place in 50 days. Passover, the barley harvest, the wheat harvest, and everything. Now we're going to get down here in 50 days. It's going to be uh, to, the day, to the feast of Pentecost. Jubilee and 50. and 50, yeah, and at Pentecost. So, okay, we better pray and close now then. And we'll, uh, uh, and, and then I'll, we'll get on to this next week. Father, we thank you so much. For this time that we've had together, Lord. And this is an exciting story. And there's so much wrapped up into this. Of the near kinsman. And the, and the redeemer, Lord. So we just pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would just. Uh, we'd be like the deer panting for your word, Lord. Like the deer panteth after the water. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.